with me this morning. God, we just thank you so much for bringing each and every one of us to this place today. Amen. God, we just thank you for the many, many blessings that flow from you. Yes. We thank you that you truly are our strength and our hope and our courage. Yes. Yes. God, we thank you that all good things flow from you and through you. And yes. God, yes. we just ask today that you let those things flow into us today. Yes. Yes. That, God, you remind us of the strength that we have in you. Yes. Yes. That, God, you let us leave here today knowing 
that we have been changed and that we can change others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you tell somebody around you they're in the right place today? We're in the right place today. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture reading is from Genesis chapter 35, verses 1 through 7. God spoke to Jacob, Go back to Bethel. Stay there and build an altar to the God who was revealed to you when you were running for your life from your brother Esau. Jacob told his family and all those who lived with him, Throw out all the alien gods which you have. Take a good bath and put on clean clothes. We're going to Bethel. I'm going to build an altar there to the God who answered me when I was in trouble and has stuck with me everywhere I have gone since. They turned over to Jacob all the alien gods they'd been holding on to, along with their lucky charm earrings. <laughs> Jacob buried them under the oak tree in Shechem. Then they set out. A paralyzing fear descended on all the surrounding villages so that they were unable to pursue the followers of Jacob. Jacob and his company arrived at Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. He built an altar there and named it El Bethel, God of Bethel, because that's where God was revealed to him. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So easily, even though we're all walking that same old road, yet we build dividing walls between our brothers, sisters, and ourselves. But I, I don't care what label you may wear.
know about you, but I just sense a special anointing in this place today. Do you feel what I feel? Yes. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just so you know, I come from a Pentecostal background. And uh, so if you're new with us, there's several of us from Pentecostal backgrounds, and there's several of us who have learned about Pentecost and just act a little Pentecostal once in a while. So I'm just telling you, if you feel the Holy Spirit in this place today, it's okay to just worship. Amen? Amen. This week when I was um, looking at scriptures for the next few weeks, Yes, we do occasionally look ahead. I was looking and I thought that the reading today was, in fact, I, it wasn't even the reading that I was looking at, but I, I was looking and I thought this was the sermon for next week. And I, I was working on it for next week and I've been working on Pride Sermon for the next week and I kept saying, but God, what's this week? What's this week? You know, I've got two weeks out, but this week I'm blank. And then God spoke to me and said, you already have it. I was obviously working on the wrong date. And so then when I spoke to um, our guest, Wayne, it occurred to me that God already knew long ago what was supposed to be talked about here today. I had read a, a scripture about an altar where God called fire out of heaven and burnt up an altar. Some of you are familiar with that Elijah story. That's what I was reading. But that wasn't the story for today's sermon. So all I got was I kept hearing God say it's, the, it's about the altar. It's time to build an altar. It's time to build an altar. Now I've preached about building an altar before. In fact, I remember um, my mentor, my supervising pastor, Reverend Wayne Lindsay, when I came into Metropolitan Community Church, I remember him preaching about an altar one time, and he had all these beautiful rocks up front. They were all different sizes, and I said they're beautiful. Not all of them were beautiful. Some of them were, you know, kind of wretched looking. And he invited people to come up at the end of service and to pray around the altar and to take one of those rocks to go back with you. And I remember picking up the biggest, ugliest one there to take back with me, and I put it in the trunk of the car, and it stayed in the trunk of the car for years because it was my altar, you see. Not just any altar. It was the one that Wayne and I had a connection with and that I had to St. John's MCC and to that particular moment in time. That was my altar. But I want to ask you something just from your own church history or maybe even your private life. What does, I want you to take just a second, just visualize an altar. Now, I'd like for you to share with me, several of you, just tell me, if, especially if you're from high church background, tell me what an altar looks like. It's okay, speak out. Steps. Off limits. Off limits. Sacred. Sacred. You're describing it. I won't know what it looks like. Big. big. <laughs> it's big. Made of stone. Made of stone. Well, it can be. Carved out of a large log. Say that again. Evergreen tree. Evergreen tree. There are all sorts of altars. My high church folks are not saying a whole lot. I, I got a couple of you. That's an altar right there. In fact, it's one of the prettiest altars I've ever seen. Isn't that pretty? Look at the woodwork right there. That's gorgeous. Most high church folks say that the communion table is the altar, and most of us low church folks, tell me, Sister Bobby, you low church like me, <laughs> have this kneeling, or they way, some yeah. kneeling bench. Yeah. All the way across the front, and a lot of times it even curved around on the sides. You've been in churches that had those, and people come up and kneel there. I put these out this morning, these little kneelers, a couple of different kinds, because some of you, especially higher church folks, can relate to this one. Um, this is really just to help your knees a little bit if you want to kneel down, because I want to invite you. 
at the end of service or at some point, especially during communion time, you're free to come up and, and kneel if you so choose. And I had one, when I pastored at the Rock MCC in Chattanooga, I actually had one built because we didn't have one. It was a building like this where we, you know, we had redone the building. It was an office building to start with. And we had redone the building, and, and, and I had one built. And, and some of my church members would giggle every time they'd come in and see that thing. It was about from here to here. And we put it on wheels so we could move it if we needed to move it. And it was about this tall, and people said, you know that thing, you know what that thing looks like? It looks like the thing at the funeral home where they put caskets. <laughs> and I said, well, that works. Because what we Pentecostal folks did at that thing was go down there and leave off the dead stuff and take on some live stuff. <laughs> So now what do you do when you go to an altar? That was one example. Maybe you do something else at your altar. What have you done at your altars? Praise, pray, take communion, give thanks, be baptized, get married, cry. <laughs> Maybe at the same time. <laughs> Say again. Confess. Ooh. There's a big one. Get for, oh, and receive forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So I, obviously many of you have ideas of what an altar is. And maybe an altar is for sacrifice. Maybe it is for a memorial of some kind. Maybe it is to remember. Because when we come up to the table here, when we come up to this altar, most altars like this, by the way, in churches, at least the ones I grew up in, had words written across the front that said, do this. It, oh, you know that. In remembrance. In other words, remember. And when we come to the altar here every Sunday, what are we doing? We're remembering something that happened over 2,000 years ago, and yet here we are remembering. And a lot of times we are asking people to check their hearts before they come there and confess anything that needs to be done away with and take on forgiveness so that each time we come there to that point in that one holy moment at some point in all of that and I don't know what holy moment it is for you that we let go of the old and take on the new. So I went back and did a little research on altars since that's what God gave me. Might as well start at the beginning of the Bible. So I started in Genesis. And I found Bethel, since this was the reading today. But Bethel is writ, uh, mentioned several times in Genesis, and I want to share with you some of the times that it's mentioned. In chapter 12 of Genesis, Abraham actually went to Bethel and built an altar there because God spoke to him there. And when he's standing there looking, he's between Bethel and some other place. I can't remember the name of the city at the moment. But he's between two places, and it's so beautiful that he builds a memorial right there. He builds a place to remember that moment, to come back to. And he prayed to God. And in chapter 13, we find him again, back at that same place, remembering and praying to God. Then we jump over to chapter 28. It's years later when Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who was in our reading today, Jacob shows up at Bethel, and wouldn't you know, a very similar thing happens to him. God made some vows to Jacob that day and said, wherever you, I'm, you see all this land, I'm giving it to you. You're going to be the leader over everything. And all of this that was your grandfather's, I'm giving it now to you. Wow. I don't know about you, but that's pretty awesome. 
If you're standing somewhere, think of the most beautiful place you've ever been, and then you're standing there and all of a sudden you hear the voice of God saying, you see all this? I'm going to give it to you. But now all of the people that come, you're going to have to be over. You're going to have to direct. You're going to have to lead. Oh, there's a price to pay for that, isn't there? God said, though, I'm going to do this, but I want you to serve me. I want you to, in other words, I want you to remember me. I don't want you to forget me. I don't want you to leave me out of your life. I want you to take me with you. And then, after God made a vow to Jacob, Jacob made a vow right back to God and says, God, I'll take you with me and I will remember you. I won't forget you. I won't let you out of my life. I'm going to hold on. And he built an altar right there. In fact, he had been asleep and used a stone for a pillow. If you can imagine. So he used that stone to start his altar. That would be the place that he would remember. The place he would come back to. The place where he and God exchanged vows. Back to that marriage thing, Miss Linda. <laughs> Exchanging vows at that altar. He poured oil on that altar. Imagine that. We have oil up here on ours too. I, I'm, the reason I'm telling you these little details is because all the way back from the book of Genesis, think of the things that you called out a while ago and the things that we associate with the altar and how many of them were actually there. He poured oil on the altar and anointed it. He christened it Bethel. We anoint people with oil to set them apart for service to God. We christen people and things at the altar of God. We exchange vows at the altar of God. And if you read on a little bit, you'll find out that someone actually died there, and so they buried her right there at a, under a tree. They carried her body and put it under a tree, so right by the altar someone died. And you'll also find that Jacob's <laughs> wife went into labor and had a child there. And, and, and let me go back another detail. It's, the scripture says it was a hard labor. Any of you people that have children know what that is? Yeah. I don't know what that is. I don't want to know what that is. <laughs> but from the, <laughs> from the you know, I, I have birthed a kidney stone before, and I cannot even imagine what a, a baby would be. But I do want to say this. I do want to say this. When I read that it was a hard label for her, I thought, okay, someone died there, and someone was born there. So life went away, and life came back. But it was a hard labor, so when she got there, it was hard work. Listen to me now. It was hard work for her to let go of the old and bring in the new. You with me? Got on your spiritual caps? Sometimes we get in our own ways and we forget to remember. And we get so busy with real life. In fact, that's what had happened here. It had been years later after that incident when our reading happened today. That was all the way over in chapter 35 and it had been at least 20 years or so. Jacob had gone to work. He had gotten married. He had worked some more. He had started gathering his own herds. He had started acquiring his own land. He had gotten married some more. 
<laughs> Traditional marriage of Genesis, many as wives as you can have. In fact, he worked seven years for one, and then the father wouldn't give him that one. He ended up with the older one. So then he worked seven more years to get the one he originally wanted. And notice what I said, the father gave her to him. And then he worked some more, and he married some more, and they had children. He had children with both of them, so we know he was having relations with both of them. And this is not uh, on civil rights right now or marriage rights, but, you know, next time somebody bothers you with that, maybe you want to bring them back to Genesis for a second. Say, just which traditional marriage are you talking about? And which, just, which biblical example are you using? He marries, he works, he works some more, he marries some more, he builds a life, he builds a family. And family, 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 family. He, he gets land, he gets servants and workers. Life just went on and on and on, and he kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Your life ever go on and on and get bigger and bigger and bigger? Not just with material things, but sometimes just life itself gets so big, and we get in our own ruts and our own ways. And I don't know about you, but it's usually those 10-year marks that get me in my age. Ooh, I remember turning 20, I remember turning 30, I remember turning 40. I do remember turning 50, vaguely. Thank you for helping me celebrate that. And each one of those years, those milestones in my life, I remember thinking, it's time to go back and look. I had to remember back. Not to just some vows I gave to God and God gave to me, but some vows I made to myself. Have I lived up to that? <coughs> Have I pursued what I wanted to pursue? Because you know a lot of life has happened in this last 10 years. A lot of things have happened, and I will just tell you, I can't jump as high as I did 10 years ago. I can't get up and down off the floor like I could 10 years ago. I can't work in the yard as long as I used to at the time without stopping to take a break. There are things I can't do now, and every now and then I think, what am I doing? Have I finished everything I wanted to do? Because what if today was the last day? There are all those promises I made to myself long ago, and some of them I've pursued and others I haven't. But I will tell you, I've taken a lot of detours. Some of it out of fear of failure. Some out of it fear of success. Some of it out of lack of confidence. Some of it out of lack of support. Some of it just because I didn't have enough money. And some of it just because I didn't know how. I didn't know where to start. Now, I'm getting a little bit better with that. We do live in the information age. So at least I'm a little better on it than I used to be. In this scripture reading today, when Fran read that, she said, God told them, I mean, Jacob told his family, I want you to go wash yourselves. I want you to put on your clean clothes. Now, one of the commentators I read said, <laughs> said this was where our, our terminology, put on your Sunday best, came from. <laughs> put on your finest, your cleanest, and... He said, put away the other gods. Now, she mentioned those uh, Lucky Charms earrings. Here's what it was, Let's just because I had to do a little research on that, because I'm going to just tell you. In the past, growing up, that was a simple explanation for that. 
you just weren't supposed to worship any other gods. If it wasn't named Jesus, you weren't supposed to get near it. And you weren't supposed to wear earrings either. Because that's what it said. Am I wrong? That's what it said. That's what it said, and if that's what it said, that's what we were taught. And I'm going to tell you that I, I don't believe either one of those anymore. Because just like, just like I can't do some of the things that I used to do physically, I can't believe some of the things that I used to believe either. Because life happened. And you know, where my foot hits the pavement sometimes is not always what I read in here or what was explained to me what somebody thought that meant. So let me tell you what, what my research indicated this time and what God gave me this week because I still believe Holy Spirit speaks to us. What, I, what these trinkets were, the earrings included, were all these trinkets that people had that they had brought along. In fact, Jacob's wife had taken them from her father's house so she could hold on to the past. Hello? Uh-oh, that brings a whole different meaning, doesn't it? She brought all these little trinkets along. She even hid them from her husband. I know none of you would ever do such a thing to your spouse. She hid them from him. Jacob had no idea that they were there, but it was brought to his attention. She was determined. She had been holding on to these things for a long time, and she wanted to keep a foot in the past. She wanted those reminders from the past, you see, to carry with her. Now, I'm not telling you you should forget all of the past. But if those things are holding you back from becoming what you can be, maybe it's time to let them go. Maybe the fire should come down from heaven and burn that up. Maybe you should be called out. Maybe somebody can say, oh, you know, where'd you get that idea? Well, that's what I grew up with. They t I heard many a preacher in the church of God tell me this. And then they said, you can't wear earrings because of scriptures like that. Well, duh. Those particular earrings that he was talking about were ones that had images and words little sayings on them from the past. Any of those little words come back to you from your past to haunt you? Any of you 12 stealth folks want to comment? Yeah. <laughs> and even those of us that are not in 12 steps, I'm going to tell you, those of us that are still in recovery from whatever denomination we came out of, and trying to unlearn and trying to leave the bad parts of that while still clinging to the parts that we want and need and that bring us joy and bring us life and bring us peace and bring us love and help us to be, because we don't want to throw out the baby with the dirty bath water, but we want to make sure the baby gets in some good, clean bath water. Turning out the old, working out the old, putting on the clean, putting on the fresh. He said, let go of all those old things that are holding us back because God is about to do something new. Amen. Now see, it's not just about throwing out all of the past because otherwise he wouldn't be going back to the altar that he built 20 years before then. Hello? So it's not just about throwing everything old out. It's about what those things do to you or for you or better yet, against you. If they're hindering you, let it go. Well, that sounds like a good New Testament salvation sermon to me. Time to let go of the old stuff that's holding you back and cling on to something new that sets you free free to receive what God has for you. It's time for 
a new vow, God says. It's time to let go of the old trinkets and the old adages, those old tapes that run around and around and around in your head that hinder you, that stop you, that, I mean, I know people that it stops cold in their tracks. In fact, I will tell you from personal experience, there are a couple of things, there are a couple of subjects I cannot talk to anyone about. You know why? Because when they start, in fact, I was at the hospital uh, recently with my family back at Christmas in North Carolina, and somebody brought something up from the past, and I started to, they wanted, they were asking me questions about something, and they knew I knew the answers, and after about three sentences, I saw myself going down this dark path, taking me back to a bad place. It wasn't bad for them, but it was bad for me. They weren't there. I lived through it. And at some point, I just had to say, I'm so sorry, but I can't tell you the rest of that story. It's not anything against you, but that just really takes me to a bad place that I don't ever want to relive again. I don't ever want to get It's not that I'm shoving it away. It's not that I haven't dealt with it. I have. But part of my dealing with it is, now that I've dealt with it, I don't want to relive it over and over and over and over again. Amen. And you know, they just said okay. And that was the end of it. We talked about something glorious and wonderful instead. I want to tell you, sometimes we have to stop that old stuff that takes us to a negative and a bad place. You say, well, all of that sounds good. What, what are you doing? Where, you know, where are you going with this? That was all back in Genesis, thousands and thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of years ago. And there's an altar, and there's an altar, and we have other kinds of altars. Where is this going, Pastor? Well, here's where it's going. God said to me, it's time to build an altar. To me. And I'm sharing it with you. It's time for you to build an altar. Your own altar. Not this. Not this. It's time for you to build an altar. A few months ago, one of you made an appointment with me and came in and just broke down and started crying. That person had had a death in her family and she said, that we don't, they cremated my family member and I don't have a grave to go visit and I'm really struggling because I have no place for a memorial and I just need some help. Will you just pray with me and can you advise me on what to do? I said, I sure can because Lord knows I've been there long enough. I sure can. I said, first of all, there are grief counselors and you need to see one. Second of all, I'm going to pray with you before you walk out the door. Third of all, maybe you need to build your own memorial. And she, she stopped crying and she just looked at me kind of puzzled. What do you mean? I said, maybe you need to build your own memorial. There's no grave to visit. You can have one at home. But I don't have his ashes. I said, do you have a picture of him? Did you know, and I told her this, I said, if you get a, a, a picture, you got something that that person gave to you, like the Curious George, <laughs> that's special to you that you've kept for years and years, and maybe even a candle the person gave to you. But if not, just a candle. And I said, just put it on a tray. I said, do you know, for right now, you may want to leave it out because that's a good place for you to go and be alone. That's a good place for you to go and remember. It may not be something that you leave out all the time because other people may not want to see it or you may not want to share it with anyone else. 
I said, did you know if you just put it on a little tray, you can just stick it up in a cabinet and pull it out anytime you need it. Other times, it may be that you want to pull it out and leave it out. Maybe it becomes a part of your decor. I have several around my house, in fact. Some of you have complimented them, not realizing that was a special altar for me. Sometimes, well, every time that I go back to North Carolina, you know that both of my parents are, are past, but I go to their, their graves. They're buried side by side, so I take fresh flowers and lay it on the graves. I don't even put it in the vases anymore. I just lay it right out between them. And I want to tell you something. There has never in all of these years, there's never been a time that I went back to visit that God didn't show up to. All of a sudden, there's this comfort. I can, it's almost like you feel enveloped, like arms hugging me. The arms, I can't get my daddy's big old arms around me anymore. I'm going to tell you something. That was a wonderful feeling. It was a wonderful feeling when I was my mama's shadow and, and for, all those, for only 10 years. But I relive moments. And it's not just that they meet me there. It's a place where I made some vows to them and to myself. When both of them passed away, I remember the last thing I told them before I left the cemetery on the days of their funerals was this. I will live my life in such a way that I will see you again. I will not forget the things you taught me, I will get to the other side when it's my turn. And you know what? Every single time, all through the years that I've gone back there, those vows come back to me. And the Holy Spirit just takes hold and wraps around me. And I can usually just feel Holy Ghost goose pimples running up and down all over, my hair standing up all over my body. I look like a big balloon. <laughs> it's a wonderful feeling to feel that Holy Spirit, to be so sad and joyous in that same moment. Several months ago, I preached about my, one of my closest friends, Daryl Mitchell. Daryl, as with a lot of us, had a little cross Somebody had given him a little necklace kind of thing. He had it hanging on his rearview mirror in the car. Anybody seen something? You got something hanging on your rearview mirror? And a lot of times when I was in the car with him, no matter what we were doing, we could be talking, laughing, cutting up. Every now and then he'd reach up and run his fingers across that cross. And no matter what we were talking about, he became silent just like that. And for about three seconds, while he ran his fingers through that cross, it was I, I started looking at him because I noticed he quit talking every time he'd do that. And all of us, I, I'd look, I started looking, and it was like he zeroed out of the whole situation for about two or three seconds, and then he was right back in the middle of the conversation and picked right up where he'd left off. And finally, one day, I asked him, I said, what in the world are you doing? What is happening? What's happening? And tears welled up as he reached up and he said, somebody special gave me that cross and every time I reach up there, I just feel their presence and the Holy Spirit meets me. Amen. Meets me. Right there in that moment, in that altar. You see, that altar was not a big, beautiful wood piece. It was just a little old simple cross hanging in his car. There's a rock in my pocket. You know what that rock is? I've had this rock ever since I started pastoring the Rock MCC in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I, I don't go anywhere without that rock in my pocket. 
It's just as important, probably more important, than my own car keys, my truck keys in my pocket. Every time I reach in my pocket and I feel that rock in there, there's an instant connection with the church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And with the beginning of my ministry, because that's the first place I pastored, it takes me back years later in remembrance of me. In that holy moment. And I mean, I can be anywhere. I can be somewhere talking to you. If you see me jiggling like this somewhere when we're chatting, I may zone out for a couple of seconds. Because if I feel that rock, I'm always reaching for the rock. That's the one thing I always want to feel down in my pocket. That rock in my pocket. It is. It's an altar. It's an altar. That's an altar. That's an altar. There are a couple of pictures I want to show you. Some of you have been to my house. You've seen that in my bedroom. You know what that is? That's one of my altars under that candle and behind that candle and those two boxes are the ashes of my little doggies that have gone over the rainbow bridge. They stay near me in my bedroom. There's another one. That Some of you haven't seen that one. That's a newer one. That's a little mermaid and a seashell. You know why that's there? It's not for a memorial of something that has happened. It's an altar because one of these days, I want to own a place at the beach. Now I don't have the money to do that. I don't even have the money to do a down payment, much less make payments, unless I sold my house now and lived in my truck. Can't have two house payments. But that little thing, I found that little mermaid at a, uh, a, a friend of mine's store, a consignment store there in, in um, Wilmington, North Carolina. And that little seashell, I went down. I walked way down the beach from the last time I went, just a few weeks ago. And I went in the general area of where I want to live when I retire. And I got that shell right there. And I put that in my bedroom, and it's right by the bathroom door. So every time I walk through there, I reach over there and touch that mermaid in that shell. Just run my fingers across as an altar of prayer and expectation and as a reminder to me uh, that ain't going to happen unless you work harder. That is just not going to happen unless you start doing some planning now. You need to start working towards that. But it's, if you don't ever think about it, you know, the day will come and I won't have any way to make it happen. So it's a constant. It's not a place where I've been before. It's a place where I want to go. You see, your altar can be all sorts of things. It can be a rock. It can be something tangible. It can be this place. It can be one of these places. And during this service, as we go into communion time, prayer time, yeah, I want you to feel free to come forward and kneel if you want or stand around the altar if you want. There's another altar. Sometimes it's not as tangible. Sometimes it's what Brother Wayne's been working on for five years. Five years he's been working on an altar, a place to remember. He's working on this play called Upstairs that remembers so many of our MCC brothers and sisters, even the, one of the pastors of that church down there that was left out, his charred body left out on the, on the, on the steps where he couldn't get out for people to come by and jeer at, and they did. And the police did not stop them. That was a different day. It's not a perfect world now, but it's better than it was. We're at least going in the right direction in most places. An altar, an altar. That's a singing one that will not only tell the painful story, but will celebrate the life that moved forward. That, by the way, that was only one of several <coughs> MCCs that were burned down. 
That was not <coughs> actually an MCC. It was a, a, a bar. But it was at a bar where MCC had been meeting up until a few weeks before then. And we don't know if the arsonists knew that or not, that they weren't meeting there anymore, if it was on purpose, if it was aimed at the church, or if it was just aimed at homosexuals in general. We may never know the answer to that. What we do know is there's now an altar. It took 40 years for there to be a real altar for that, a real tribute. But it's here. And we get the opportunity to sit with one of our fellow MCCers who, who wrote it. So today, I want to invite you, as Wayne comes over, he's going to get ready to sing for us. He's going to sing a song from the, from the show. He wrote all the songs, so uh, he's going to sing a song that he wrote. I want you to invite you. I started to bring some rocks or some other materials for you to pick up and take home, but the Holy Spirit just kept saying no. The Holy Spirit just kept inviting me to invite you to go build your own altar. Because I can give you stuff, but it's not going to mean the same thing. Go build yourself an altar. Go back to that place where vows were made. Go back to that place. And if you say, well, I never did. Well, now's a good place to start. Now's a good time to start. Go and make some vows, not only to God, make some vows to yourself. Set some goals of what you want. You can remember back, but remember to leave all those old trinkets behind that are holding you back. Just remember to come back to the places that lift you up instead of take you down. Amen. Amen. Now I'm on sweet out prayer. <laughs> I had um, my own chance to go back to my ancestral home, and uh, I've come from a family reunion. That's where I was this morning when I drove down from Natchitoches, and uh, my niece got a hold of my sheet music. <laughs> it, does, it matters what we choose to remember and what we choose to forget. And I think a lot of people chose to forget about this fire because it was so painful. But in the process, we've forgotten about the victims. And there's things about those victims that we should remember, and I'm going to remember something to you. The, um, one of the two, uh, well, two of the MCers that died, um, one of them, well, they had both uh, been tapped by uh, someone who knew a back way out. And... Uh, this, this fella uh, kind of kicked the back door down and uh, Mitch um, made it out and his partner, Lewis, somehow I kind of got lost on the way out and so Mitch turned around and he went back inside to rescue his partner in 1973 and uh, they both died there in the fire and it was an act of, of love and an act of sacrifice and an act of heroism that ought to be remembered. So in this song, this is before the fire takes place, and in this song, uh, this is Mitch talking to Horace and making a promise, building an altar, making a vow to Horace, to his partner, Horace, also known as Lewis. Things go long, clocks go wrong, compromises come along. I can't promise I'll never leave, but I'll always return. Modern age 
life to wage. To get ahead must turn the pain. I can't promise I'll never leave. But I'll always, I will always return. Surety is uncertain. Uncertainty is a fact. Take your strength when we're apart from knowing I'll be back. Never vow. I will always Keith already pointed out he had his little rock in the pocket in his pocket. I, I always have my little green marble. So I, some of you have heard that story before. I don't know what it says about us that the two of us are playing in our pockets, but we're not going to go there today. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but you know, I have the little green marble that reminds me that all the good things I have come from God. That that's every time I reach in my pocket, they're among the change, but they're among the other money as well. All of that came from God. And this is the time in our service to remember that and to share those things. You know, our, our church is about to celebrate its 30th birthday in a few months. So we've been around a long time, and we've only been around, and MCC as a denomination has only been around because of the support of people like us, and it only survives through that support. So I invite you now to join in our offering, and will you pray with me? God, we just thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us, and God, we ask you to open our hearts and open our minds and God just make us more than willing to share what we have to support your ministries in our community and around the world and God bless this offering and help us to spread it just as far as it can go to do that work in Jesus name Amen, amen. my sisters and brothers it comes time for us to come to the table of God to come to this altar to come to this place of remembrance I want to tell you the story on Jesus' night that he was to be betrayed. He was having a meal with his disciples, with all of his followers, well, maybe not all of them, but lots of his followers there, having a celebration. And boy, was it one to remember. At the end of that meal, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it, and he said, this is the bread of life. And he broke it and blessed it and passed it to everyone in that place. Then he took the cup and he blessed it and he passed it to everyone. He said, this is the cup of forgiveness. The forgiveness of all that's old, let it go the time to let go of the old and take on the new. Do this, he said, when you come together. Do this in remembrance of me. So my sisters and brothers, over 2,000 years later, we're doing this 
And in this moment, we remember that moment. So examine your heart. Have you been carrying around those old trinkets that take you down a dark path? Then now is the time to let go of them. Now is the time to begin building that new altar. Will it be work for some of you? Oh, yes. Labor. Remember, labor. But if you birth something new, you got to go through the work to get there. It's not just the fun part. It's the work part. We have to let the dead be gone, and we have to let new life spring forward. My sisters and brothers, as you come to the table of God today, please know that whether you are with us for the first time or the millionth time, you are welcome at God's table. You see in Metropolitan Community Church, we serve an open communion. That means everyone is welcome at the table of God. It means everyone can come to the table. We take the bread, dip it in the non-fermented grape juice, place it on your tongue, or if you so choose, cup your hands and we'll place it in your hands and you may serve yourself. If you have a special need or would like a special blessing, there will be prayer partners on either side that will be willing to pray with you and bless you. The only thing we ask is that you come at the direction of our usher. So would the acolytes and servers please come forward. As many of you uh, know, today is the last Sunday that um, Becky and Jess will be with us. Um, they just finished teaching school this year, and they've been with a, a teaching program that brought them to Louisiana, and that time is now up, and they are moving this coming week to Boston, Massachusetts, where they will start pursuing the next leg of their journey. And we have a custom around here. When we have people that leave us, we send them forth as missionaries from this church because we know that they've built an altar in their hearts with us, and they're certainly going to be with in our hearts. And so I'd like to ask them if they would to come and stand here. And any of you who would like to lay hands on them, feel free to come forward and to bless them and... Um, the rest of you, if you would, just stretch your hand forth this way as we lay hands on them. Precious God, we just want to say thank you for bringing these two beautiful ladies to our church. Thank you for the blessing that they have been to us, for blessing us during communion times, for preaching, for working behind the scenes on some programming for our children for just their very presence here that can light us up like a Christmas tree. Amen. God, you can't be in their presence for more than a few minutes to know that there's something special going on between them and something between them and you. And God, we thank you because they found us and they found you and we all found you together. I thank you because of this place that we have come and joined our hearts together and our spirits together. And I pray, Lord, that not only will the things that they have done here be a blessing to them, but as they start their next leg of their journey in life, in going to school, in going to seminary, in preaching and teaching and all the other things that they want to pursue, I pray for your anointing to be upon them and that as they go out, a piece of MCC of Baton Rouge will go with them as an altar in their hearts and spirits just as they will continue to be an altar in our hearts and a part of our history. And we just ask that you will keep the way safe for them, bring them much security and safety where they go, and God, bring them as much support and love there that they have found here. Even more, Lord. Just keep opening the doors that need to be open for them and let them go forward because, God, they have the energy and the desire to minister for you, to work for you, and let them continue to let that light shine out wherever they are. In the name of Jesus our Christ, amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Would you join us in singing our last song? pray with me. God, we want to say thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. Thank you for this wonderful time of worship. I pray that we have been blessed, all of us blessed, and all of us changed. And I pray that we will once again be reminded of where we've been and where we're going. And God, help us to build the altars that we need to build this very week. Help us to put away things that take us to dark places, but help us, Lord, even if it's a little bit of work, yes, even if it's labor, to birth something new and wonderful in our futures. Yes. We ask that you will now bless the food to the nourishments of our bodies and our bodies to your service and your divine will. We ask you to bless Becky and Jess as they begin their journey. Amen. And we ask you to bless Wayne as he continues in the next couple of days Amen. to get the funding, the rest of the funding that he needs for this play to go forward. Um, and I pray that you'll keep your hand on him and give him traveling mercies and remind him, God, constantly that we don't have a music director right now. Either. We ask these things in the name of Jesus our Christ and all things that are holy. Amen. Amen.